Hi, welcome to Stories of Art. My name is Karel Huidekoper and today I'd like to tell you the story of Galatea and in particular the version painted by Raphael in the Villa Farnesina in Rome. But before I get started, I'd like to remind you that you could really help my channel by subscribing to it and uh, liking videos, but you could even help me more by sharing videos with whomever you think might be interested. But let's get started. The Galatea by Raphael is in the Villa Farnesina in Rome, as I said before. Now, the Villa Farnesina is or was once owned by the Farnese family and was named by them. And it's called Farnesina to distinguish it from the Palazzo Farnese, which is a much larger, bigger palace that is also in Rome. Actually, it's really close by, it's just across the river. But it was built for Agostino Schigi between 1506 and 1510. He was a banker from Siena and he had become enormously wealthy. By some estimates, he was actually at some point the richest man in Europe. And he had this villa made outside of the city, situated between the Vatican and Trastevere, which is a neighborhood now of Rome and today a favorite spot for tourists because it has all this nightlife and wonderful restaurants and stuff. But at the time, that this villa was built, it was sort of outside of everything. It stood outside the city and was surrounded by luscious gardens, some of which actually still survive to this day. And in it, he wanted Raphael to paint decorations for several rooms, or actually loggias. Now, a loggia is a long room with lots of windows to one side, so you have lots of light there, and they had just started building things like this in France. They were ideal places for showing off art and they were really the height of fashion in architecture. Now, the problem was that Raphael was a very much sought after artist who kept being called away to work for other people, such as the Pope. And Shigi himself occupied Raphael with a number of other projects as well. For instance, he had him paint an altar in Santa Maria della Pace, near the Piazza Navona, and he had him build a chapel in the Santa Maria del Popolo, which is surprising because Raphael really wasn't much of an architect. He was a brilliant painter though, and this is one of his many really, really good works. Anyway, Raphael was so busy that he could never make the time to paint these two large loggias. So in the end, they had other painters take over the work, such as uh, Giulio Romano and Sebastiano del Piombo. But also the architect of the building, a man called, called uh, Baldassare Perugi. Now, Giulio Romano was a student of Raphael's and Sebastiano del Piombo was one of the great talents of his age that we've more or less forgotten about. I mean, you never see him mentioned in any of the great big art history books because he was simply eclipsed by people like Michelangelo and, and Raphael. But if you look around in Rome, and the churches especially, you see his work everywhere. He was extremely prolific, had a large workshop, and he was really good. And I mention him here because he was part of this project and actually part of this one particular fresco. You see, the Galatea was supposed to be part of a larger series of mythological scenes that would cover all the walls of the room. The ceiling had already been painted by Paruzzi. It's filled with gods symbolizing all kinds of celestial bodies and together they form sort of the horoscope of the birth date of Agostino Schicchi. So that had been done before Raphael had been commissioned and it had probably already been decided that the wall was going to be separated into several scenes to be filled out later. And what you can see that it was divided up into these spaces that could be filled with a scene. But only two of them were actually done. Uh, two of them have a mythological scene. The rest was left undone when they abandoned the project. All these other spaces were left empty until they were filled up with landscape somewhere in the 17th century. Now there's also a number of lunettes. Those are those semicircular spaces above at the top of the wall. And they were painted by Sebastiano del Piombo most likely after Galatea was finished. But Raphael and Sebastiano del Piombo must have worked together, at least to some extent, on these two scenes that we see here, because they're related. And in history books, you always see only this one picture of Galatea and not the scene next to it, which is a shame, I think. Now let me briefly tell you the story of Galatea. It's a name that pops up a number of times throughout mythology. There's this famous story of Pygmalion, who sculpted a woman and fell in love with his own work and eventually she came to life. I actually made a video about that one earlier so if you're interested in that there's a link up there and there's a link in the description of this video. 
But that's not the Galatea that this story is about. Our Galatea was a sea nymph or a nereid of exceptional beauty. There are actually several love stories about her and in all of them there's a role played by Polyphemus. And Polyphemus was a cyclops, a one-eyed giant. And the trouble with these cyclopses was that they were, well, not too bright and very strong and quite savage. In most of mythology where Polyphemus is mentioned, it is his heavy emotions and his enormous strength that cause trouble. He's also the Cyclops mentioned in the Odyssey. He is the one that is eventually blinded by Odysseus. But Polyphemus here is in love with Galatea. But she is not in love with him because she knows he's a dangerous brute. So to woo her, he plays music on his flute. And because he's led by love, he does this so well that when she hears it, she is drawn towards him. And as she gets closer to the shore where he's sitting uh, playing, he sees her and he stops playing. And that breaks the spell. She sees him, realizes he's big and dangerous, and so she tries to get away from him. And that's what we're seeing here. By the way, as she flees, he becomes sad. And after a few hours, he starts to play again. And that enchants her all over again. And she comes back and the pattern just repeats and repeats. And some ancient writers say that that's where we get the tides from. So what we see is the fleeing Galatea. And the image behind her, to the left, is that of Polyphemus with his flute. He's holding it under his arm. He's ready to get up to receive her. And then, of course, she runs away. And I love the fact that you can see in the scale that she is tiny compared to this enormous giant. And in the story, that works perfectly. Also, originally, Polyphemus was naked, which emphasizes his bruteness. And at some point, and I'm not entirely sure when, he was given this blue dress to cover him up. This, by the way, is not the only love story of Galatea, because she is in love with Aces. He is a shepherd and the son of uh, a god, Faunus or Pan, and a nymph. And they have a real romance, a reciprocated love story. Uh, they both love each other. I emphasize this because it's quite rare in mythological stories. But it is only a brief love story because Polyphemus happens upon them. He becomes jealous and he grabs a large boulder and he throws it at Aces and he crushes him. Galatea is, of course, devastated, and with the help of some of the other gods, she turns the stream of blood that comes out of Aces into a stream of water, and he becomes a brook that forever flows into her as she is a sea nymph. So, the stories of Galatea are all about love. One about the possessive, obsessive love that she tries to escape from, and the other a more gentle and complete and real love. Now, this fresco is often called the Triumph of Galatea, and that is because she is running away from the wrong kind of love, the obsessive and possessive version, and she's on her way to true love. Now, on the painting we can see her standing on a shell pulled forth by two dolphins. And it also seems to have some sort of drive of its own. It has some sort of a, a paddle on the side, like in a, a paddle boat. But she's mostly surrounded by all kinds of sea creatures that express love for one another in all kinds of different ways. There's a triton here in the foreground. It's a creature, half man, half sea animal, who embraces a, another nereid. And in the background, on the right side, there's a sea centaur, who is embraced by, I guess, again, a nereid or, or a mermaid. It all depends on who that tail behind them belongs to. And then there's these two other sort of figures, one on the right blowing a trumpet and one on the left riding a seahorse and blowing on a shell. Both are clearly celebrating her triumph of love. And then there are the little Cupid-like creatures. There's five of them, four in the sky and one on the sea. You can see three of them aiming their arrows sort of at Galatea and one is in the clouds with some spare ammunition. Now, there isn't just one Cupid. Well, that's not entirely true. There is one Cupid, but he is the god of falling in love. But he has six brothers, according to Greek mythology. And each of them represents a different kind of love. And the number of seven here means simply a lot of them, uh, or all of them. The number seven very often simply means everything. 
compared to someone who claims he has sailed the seven seas, you're not supposed to ask which particular seas they have sailed. It simply means they've sailed the lot. Now, there are seven brothers responsible for different kinds of love because the Greek recognized that there are a multitude of ways of loving. There's a difference between the love of a parent for a child or between friends or that between lovers and even between lovers there's falling in love there's lust there's loving in a nurturing way the love that grows in time etc etc there's all kinds now in most stories about love cupid plays a role because he is responsible for the overwhelming feeling of attraction that is falling madly in love at first sight or repulsion because cupid can also make you be disgusted by someone and what we see here is a group of Cupids or his brothers loosing off this sort of salvo of arrows and representing different forms of love. And there's a good reason that there's only three of them here that are shooting, and that's the composition. Because Raphael went out of his way to balance this composition. All the movements of all the figures seem to be echoed by others, but while these Cupids are seemingly sort of shooting at Galatea, only one of them actually is. The other two are shooting at the other couples. Just look, if we follow this arrow here, it ends up there. And this one goes there. It ends up with one of the other couples that are grabbing each other in different ways, representing different forms of love. And if we follow the gaze of Galatea, it turns out that she is looking at the little guy in the clouds who's not shooting, but holding on to arrows. It's possibly saying that she doesn't need any new arrows because she's been shot by them enough. And then, of course, there's this little Cupid lying on the water below. He is actually pointing something out to us. You see? He's pointing towards the two dolphins. And when we look closer, one of the two dolphins has an octopus in his mouth. It's a small detail, but Raphael used an entire... Cupid to point it out to us. So it must be important. So what does it mean? Well, I can't be 100% sure, but there is this book that was popular at the time. It's called the Haliotica. I think that's how you pronounce it. This is how you spell it. It was written by a poet named Opica in the second century, and in it he described the behavior of various animals of the seas. And he tells us that dolphins and octopuses are each other's opposites. Dolphins, in his eyes, are the lords of the sea, and octopuses are the exact opposite. They are the lowlifes. They are smart, but they are cruel. Dolphins are associated with sea gods, while octopuses are horrid creatures in well, his eyes, obviously. Dolphins are majestic, while octopuses just grab with their tentacles, with suckers on them, and then drag even the biggest fishes down to the depths where they devour them. He associated dolphins with real love and octopuses with possessiveness. They assault, they grab without consent, we might say today. This, of course, has nothing to do with reality, but it's what Opica wrote. And it may well be the reason that Raphael added this detail, because it fits really well with the theme of the painting. And we know that Opica was a popular text at the time. Now, there's always some speculation as to the looks of Galatea. People have often wondered if Raphael used a real person as a model to base her on. Well, when historians gossip about their subjects, it's called speculation. And it has been speculated that this is a portrait of a lady called Imperia, because she just happened to be the mistress of Agostino Chigi. The main problem is that we don't have any other reliable portraits of her, so we can't really compare it to anything. So while it's fun to speculate, it's really nothing more than, than a guess. And then there's another legend about this room, and it goes something like this. At some point, when Raphael was at work in this loggia, Michelangelo came to visit. He had just started work on the Sistine ceiling, and it's only a few kilometers walk from the one to the other, so it's an afternoon stroll. The most well-known version of the story was told to us by Vasari. He wrote a book about biographies of artists of all kinds, that lived before him and up into his own time. And he lived in the 16th century, so he actually interviewed people like Michelangelo. 
but never Raphael because Raphael already died when Vasari was quite young. So in Vasari's account, we always hear the side of Michelangelo, never the side of Raphael from his own mouth. And Vasari tells us that Michelangelo and Raphael had a great big rivalry, that Raphael tried to steal ideas from Michelangelo. But at some time, Michelangelo was curious as to what Raphael was doing. He visited him, but Raphael wasn't there at the time. So he was let into the room and he waited there for him, looking at this Galatea. And when it took too long for Raphael to come back, he decided to leave. But before he did, he left a calling card. He took a bit of charcoal and in one of the lunettes in the room, he quickly drew the head of a man on one of the lunettes. And it's this one. And the story goes that when Raphael returned, he immediately recognized the genius of Michelangelo and ordered that it would never be painted over. And people listened because when Sebastiano del Piombo painted these lunettes after the uh, project of the Galatea was done, he left this one untouched. However, today we don't think that this is a Michelangelo anymore. Uh, and we think that this drawing was made at some later stage. But the story is still told today. Now, it's definitely true that Raphael was inspired by the work of Michelangelo. We can see that in his style, in his entire way of working that changed dramatically after he was introduced to, to Michelangelo's work. And it's one of the things that makes Raphael so great. It's that he could learn from others and absorb their influences and their talents and then make those influence part of his own work. I use the word influenced because he never copied. He was inspired by the work of others. Just look at what he started to do when he was introduced to the work of Leonardo da Vinci about a, a decade earlier. He made these soft and sweet Madonnas with the soft techniques that he had seen in the work of Leonardo. And he used the type of composition that Leonardo had just pioneered to make these intimate little groups that are so well ordered. And after coming to Rome, after seeing the work of Michelangelo, his figures become decidedly more muscular. And he started to place his figures in these expressive poses that was definitely something that was typical for the work of Michelangelo before him. Because Michelangelo made all these turned torsos on the Sistine ceiling and the idea is would Raphael have seen any of these? Well, he most likely did at some point, but not before he painted his Galatea because Michelangelo hadn't even started on them yet. And for centuries we thought that Michelangelo was solely the inspiration for the work of Raphael. But today we think it's much more of a two-way street. Today we think that Raphael and Michelangelo influenced each other. And it may even be the case that Raphael for a time worked or assisted on the work of the Sistine Chapel. It may well be that Michelangelo saw him much more as an equal at the time. And decades later, when he talked to Fazari, he exaggerated his talents over that of Raphael. Because on closer inspection, it might well be that it was Michelangelo who was sometimes directly influenced by Raphael. You see, 20 years after the Galatea was finished, Michelangelo made this sculpture in Florence. He made it as part of a funerary monument for Pope Julius II, but in the end, he never used it for the actual tomb. And in it, you can see that it has this turned torso and a raised knee. And if you compare it to the Galatea, you can see that they're pretty similar. Now, if you want to see Galatea for yourself, you'll have to go to Rome and find the Villa Farnesina, which is on the road between Trastevere and the Vatican. There's also the second loggia there that's painted by Giulio Romano, which is also spectacular, but will be the subject of a different video. But before you go there, I need to remind you of the fact that you could, of course, like this video, you could subscribe to my channel, which would be nice, but you would do me a really big favor if you could also share this video with whomever might be interested. All you have to do is copy the link and paste it into a WhatsApp or an email or Twitter, Facebook, whatever. In any case, thank you very much for listening and uh, hope to see you again soon.